This is Rogers TV. The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Securing your recycling in a few steps is simple, like bundling your cardboard separately. These bundles can act as a lid for your blue box or placing heavier items such as magazines on top of papers with no material above the rim. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talk Politics. I'm Deborah Hutchison in the Rogers TV studio. Uh, on this edition, we have two guests today, both joining us via video. We have Durham MPP Lindsay Park, and we have Brampton South MPP Prabhmeet Sarkaria, who is also the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. That is a long title. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Prabhupada. Okay. Uh, so we are taping this on May 7th. Uh, two days ago, y you both took part in a uh, round table, a virtual round table, uh, speaking with Durham businesses about their challenges during COVID-19. Um, Lindsay, let's, let's start with you. What were, what were you hearing from some of these businesses and their challenges? Yeah, so two, uh, two days ago, we were able to gather um, uh, virtually uh, a bunch of small businesses from all across Durham, and we, ha we were privileged to have join us uh, Minister Sakaria and uh, Minister Monty McNaughton, who is the, the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Um, and of course, both of those ministries uh, have a heavy load uh, right now, as we uh, as we respond to the challenges that have presented themselves because of because of COVID nineteen, and and so we were able to bring together a, a cross section of businesses in the Durham region and and just hear directly from them um, on how they think we could better support them, um, and particularly as we enter this phase now where where um, everyone's eager to reopen and small businesses being um, the chief chief among the groups that that want to reopen. Um, how, how that will look, uh, what things we can do to support them through that process. Um, so that was that was the topic, and it was uh, uh, you know nothing nothing can replace hearing directly from from the the front lines in any industry, but but directly from bin business owners who are are living this reality every day. Minister Sarkaria, what what were you hearing from these businesses? What was uh, perhaps two of the the most common challenges, worries, concerns? Yeah, there was, uh, uh, you know, first of all, I, I've got to give a, a shout out to my colleague, uh, MPP Park. Uh, this was actually the second round table I've been able to host with her to kind of hear from Durham, the, the Durham region directly on the supports and, and needs and gaps that exist uh, um, within the current programs. Uh, you know, previously we talked about the small business loans that um, didn't allow for businesses with payrolls over 50, uh, under $50,000 to apply. We had that, you know, through advocacy at those roundtables, listening to front uh, the business owners from the front lines. We were able to advocate for changes to that, and I'm hearing kind of similar things um, that, uh, through this roundtable that we had just a couple of days ago with MPT Park. It was really centered around uh, some current concerns with uh, the, the rental assistance program that the, the government, uh, the, both the federal and provincial governments, were, were, were uh, had, had released. Um, so there was a couple of concerns that we uh, that we heard from there. Uh, there was issues with landlords who didn't uh, hold mortgages on properties. Um, there was uh, issues around, uh, uh, how, you know, just some uncertainty that was around the program. It hasn't completely been launched uh, over the, uh, and it will be launched over the next week or two. Uh, so we found that uh, uh, very critical uh, for us to, to learn and to hear directly from business owners. Uh, so when we are having our conversations with the federal government, uh, um, when we're speaking to them, you know, about the gross rent uh, portion of, of leases and how that's completely not covered right now, that's very helpful because we can take real life examples from businesses that participated in that roundtable, and then be able to take that up to to our both the Ministry of Finance and to our federal partners and say, here are where the gaps exist. 
and this is really re really where we need to focus. Uh, the other issues uh, that uh, that came up uh, were also centered around the, the PPE uh, and how businesses will be able to access PPE um, uh, coming up uh, in, as the economy uh, shifts towards reopening. So we've seen some great uh, uh, strides uh, given how careful we have been as a government and that the people of Ontario have taken this very seriously. There have been concerns around how PPE shortages could be addressed uh, through the small business community. But I've got to say, uh, in Durham is playing a very key role in uh, uh, putting a lot of these PPEs together. And I know in PP Park, uh, I can share many examples locally uh, of Durham companies stepping up to the plate and supporting um, uh, this fight against COVID-19. Yeah, that, that, the PPE, that, that is an excellent point because once these businesses do open, uh, you know, business as usual isn't, is, is no more. And they are going to be as concerned with the masks and the hand sanitizers as, as healthcare workers and how do they get their hands on them. Exactly, Deborah. That, that's that, and that's exactly what we heard uh, during the roundtable. Is um, people are starting to look to that next phase, of the opening, and you know we've all heard the concerns around, especially um, when the crisis began, the shortages around PPE um, as our health sector was was trying to get their hands on what they needed um and it's we're in a much better place now than we were at the start and in addition to that um we have local companies companies all over the province but uh really proud of some of them in durham region that have stepped up to to make sure we're producing uh the ppe locally so we're never again having to rely on other countries um, to apply some of these um, most fundamental needs around health and safety. And so some examples in Durham region, we've seen some, some craft breweries, all or nothing brewery in Oshawa has, has stepped up and retooled to produce hand sanitizer. Uh, during this time, we have a, a number of companies in my riding, one in Scugog and one in Clarington, who um, are um, going through the approval process to, to sell face shields within Ontario. Uh, we've also seen OPG and Ontario Tech team up to use their 3D printing capabilities uh, to produce face shields. So lots of local examples and uh, the wheels are in motion to make sure as we reopen, uh, some of these products are on the market for small businesses. So let's, uh, news yesterday um, that Ontario will further ease restrictions on uh, retail stores and, and essential uh, construction. We are taping this on Thursday, May 7th by Friday, May 8th uh, when this show airs. Um, garden centers, nurseries will be able to open. Let's talk about uh, the changes, Minister, that, that were announced yesterday. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, as we look towards where we were with COVID a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, we really didn't know what we were up against. Uh, but we've seen that the sacrifices that we've made are really paying off. When we look at the modeling, Ontario is really headed towards a best case scenario. So when we see the numbers under control, we see our you know health, frontline healthcare workers have done an incredible job of keeping us safe, and we've all played a critical role. You know, uh, from public awareness standpoint, everyone kind of taking it upon themselves to be safe. Um, we've now shifted towards this conversation of reopening the economy, and so we want to be able to do it in a pragmatic uh, uh, way, in, in a way that can support small businesses. We we recognize the significant sacrifice small business owners have made. So one of the initiatives that we that we took is. As of next Monday, curbside pickup, uh, as long as you have a storefront, will be allowed. And I think this is a, a good way for us to be able to condition ourselves uh, as we move to the next phases of uh, battling COVID-19, how we can do it, but in a way that we can still maintain the safety. Because we really don't want to get in a situation where we move too quickly and then we're back in a situation like this once again where we're, locked, uh, we're on a lockdown and we see these significant economic impacts across the board. So I think that's really critical. And at all times, you know, we're going to have a huge emphasis, uh, as Minister McNaughton, even at that roundtable, was uh, uh, stating on uh, the health and safety of uh, the employees, our workers, our consumers. So, um, you know, they've increased uh, uh, compliance officers as well to make sure that all rules are being monitored. The government has uh, put forward white papers on how businesses should be um, uh, moving forward and what kind of safety procedures they should be putting in place. But I think it's an exciting uh, time for us to, to really 
really look at looking forward now as, as we look towards uh, weathering the storm, but more so how are we going to come out of this even stronger and how are we going to give our businesses a chance to, to succeed once again. And I think this is a great way for us to, to send that signal and that we're going to work with our business community. We're going to work with our small businesses to give them every opportunity possible to get back on their feet and the government will always be there to support them in that endeavor. Uh, so now that we're allowing some businesses to dip their toes in the water and, and are easing some restrictions, if we find or hear of complaints of, you know, customers not adhering of long lineups outside a store for, for pickups, um, is there the, the chance that uh, you'll have to revisit those rules? I'll jump in here, Deborah. I think what what people watching this show need to know if they encounter um, uh, something that concerns them, they see people not following public health orders that remain in place um, as they're going about some of these expanding expanded shopping activities. Um, they can always call Durham Public Health and uh, report a concern they have. Um, and Durham Public Health has a process where they look into, they have their own inspectors and they, they all look into uh, what's happening. Um, and, and I've found them, as have, have many of my constituents I've, I've talked to, found them to be uh, responsive uh, in, in looking into those concerns. Um, and, to, and also businesses have found them to, to be taking the right approach uh, in trying to educate them um, rather than uh, kind of a really hefty uh, first-time incident fine without explanation. Uh, they've found the, uh, the inspectors to be very good. Um, so so that's, that's one piece. Um, and then, then obviously we're going to have to continue to watch, watch closely what the, the local numbers are and the province-wide numbers are on the number of cases of COVID-19 as this uh, as this goes on, uh, I think as Minister Sakaria alluded to earlier, um, the one thing we all have in the back of our head is we, we don't want to take uh, steps too quickly, uh, reopening the economy um, and then uh, create the conditions for a second wave uh, of this that, you know, potentially is worse than the first wave. Okay, uh, we've only got about a minute left. Uh Minister Sarkaria is only with us the, the first half of the show. Uh, before we go, I just want to give you congratulations on behalf of Rogers TV. You're a brand new papa. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm enjoying every second uh, of my uh, uh, new journey into fatherhood, and it's been an absolute pleasure. But I, I really do appreciate uh, your uh, your wishes. Thank you so much, and thank you so much uh, for having me on. Well, and and. Your baby was born during COVID-19, quite the experience. It has been. It was, it was really quite the experience from start to finish, uh, getting to the hospital. Uh, you know, a lot of restrictions within the hospitals, uh, a lot of restrictions uh, in terms of visitors. So, um, but I'm just very thankful that, that there's a healthy baby, uh, baby girl. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm learning very quickly that sleep is very hard to come by as, uh, as, as a father. So, but I'm, I'm very thankful and loving every second of it. Okay. We are out of time for our first segment. Stay with us. More to come on Talk Politics after the break. Securing your recycling in a few steps is simple, like crushing your cans and bottles down in your container's blue box and your box board down in your paper's box. This saves a lot of space and reduces the possibility of material blowing out of your blue box on windy days. It was John's graduation. We were so proud. We all got together for a picnic. That's when we heard coming from the radio. So we stopped and we listened. It helped us get to safety. That's why when I think of I think of John, because now he has a real future to look forward to. Hey, do you like movies? You know I do, that's why I see all of them. And if you wanna know which ones you should see too, check out the latest Cinema Scene reviews and interviews. They're hot, fresh, 
and delicious, and they're online at rogerstv.com slash cinemascene, popcorn not included. This offer is available everywhere. Tell your friends, be the first on your block to click rogerstv.com slash cinemascene. It's so nice, we have to mention it twice. On this brand new edition of Social Life From Home, we speak to the creator of the viral quarantine version of The Simpsons intro. Plus, our tech expert Karen shares his review of Sony's new wireless headphones. Welcome back to Talk Politics. Our guest this week is MPP for Durham, Lindsay Park. Our thanks once again to uh, Minister Sarkaria for joining us in the first half of the show. Uh, Lindsay, we, we were talking in the break about uh, Durham's numbers of cases of COVID-19. And for your area, they're relatively low. Clarington, Scugog, um, Admittedly, do you look at the numbers and go, Phew, thank goodness? Certainly. I mean, we've seen in other other parts of Durham region, you know, Pickering area, long-term care homes there that have been very hard hit um, uh, by COVID-19. And so far, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about how things have been going in, in the very east end of Durham region in, in Scugog and Clarington. But we, we've all seen how one misstep, you know, uh, uh, getting too loose too quickly on some of the health guidance uh, can le can have devastating consequences. And so um, I just want to thank everyone in East Durham for how in incredibly cooperative they've been, really taking leadership and taking it upon themselves to follow the public health guidance, um, and uh, and also. Uh, really come together as a community to, to meet the needs we're, we're all facing. You are parliamentary assistant to the Attorney General of Ontario. COVID-19, of course, has had a huge impact on our, our courts and challenges there. You're absolutely right, Deborah. And one of the things, uh, stories I would, I would tell over and over when I first came into this role in, in uh, June of 2018, was in the justice sector, um, it, you can really highlight the challenges we have um, by the fact that if you were a lawyer in the uh, from the 1970s that had retired in 1970 and you walked into a courtroom today, uh, you would see largely the same system uh, and you probably can continue on practicing as though nothing had changed. And you know, some people may say that, that is a good thing and some people not, but it really indicates there haven't, hasn't been that advancement in technology uh, that we've seen in other sectors of the economy. Um, and uh, the, the line our, our current attorney general has been, been using is that we've really advanced 25 years in 25 days uh, with the COVID-19 uh, crisis because we've been forced, uh, everyone's been um, you know, motivated to come together and find solutions. Um, and so we've seen in that, in that time, in weeks, uh, we've been moving from that sluggish, outdated system to see many more virtual and remote hearings. Um, we're also uh, avoiding now transferring individuals between locations uh, for bail hearings and other urgent criminal matters. Uh, we've seen process streamlined in in every courthouse now in the province, you can file documents um, uh, electronically. We've we've created that capability, um, and uh, and I'm pleased to report that that in the Ontario Court of Justice, um, every courtroom now um, is operating remotely. Um, so we've certainly made uh, great strides. Um, there, there's more to do, uh, for sure, but I hope, uh, I hope we can, can take this progress and, and build on it, um, after we get through this crisis. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Do you think then that this will continue? This will become part of the new norm following, you know, COVID-19? I think everyone in the justice sector broadly agrees on that, including, including the attorney general and our government, uh, in that we will refuse to 
to go back to the old uh, when we're on the other side of this and that it's really important that we build on this progress for uh, the benefit of all Ontarians. Um, and really, um, some of these progresses and, and, and uh, advance in, advancement in technology can help us also get through some of the backlogs we know we're going to have um, on the other side of this. Um, and one thing I, I would like to mention, um, just that I was really pleased in the justice sector we were able to do um, during this crisis, is really be responsive um, to victims of, of violent crimes. Uh, you, you know, I was speaking to um, the local executive director of, of victim services early on in this um, crisis, the Durham Region Victim Services, and. Um, she was saying they were seeing, you know, a 30% increase in reports of domestic violence yeah. during this. Um, and so that those, those are serious numbers and it meant they needed additional um, funds to, to, support, to support victims. Um, and so we were able to give them a, 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 a big boost in funding, uh, one-time funding to support them through this crisis. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I can't imagine uh, what it's like to, to go through that at this time. St you know, everyone's um, being asked to stay home, and we just know the reality is for some people, home is not a safe place. Uh, before COVID-19, uh, we were talking, you and I were talking a lot about the GO Train expansion uh, to Bowmanville. That, that was making big headlines. What has the effect of COVID-19 been on that project? I think regardless of, of whether we saw a crisis like COVID-19 or not, the, the GO train to Bowmanville uh, was a priority for this, for this government and certainly for, for me locally, I've been, I've been clear on, on the, the need to get this project done. And so I'm really pleased um, uh, there have been recent meetings um, between Metrolinx and, um, and local officials on this project. The meetings are continuing, they're continuing to work on the preliminary design business case for this project. Um, and so uh, like everyone watching um, uh, and, and you, Deborah, we're all eager to see that, that uh, preliminary design business case get completed so we can uh, start some tangible movement uh, uh, and get shovels in the ground on this project. What about the Bowmanville Hospital expansion? Has COVID-19 put the, the brakes, so to speak, on that project? I think work is continuing within all all the ministries on some of these longer term projects, and uh, certainly I would say actually COVID nineteen has highlighted even more uh, the need to to make sure we're continuing to modernize our hospitals and our long term care uh, facilities to meet uh, the modern demands. We all know the the Bowmanville Hospital was really built for a rural community. Um, and we're, we're no longer a, just a rural community um, in Bowmanville. Uh, it's, it's booming. There are lots of young families moving uh, to this area, and it's right for them to expect when they move here, they want to make sure the health care services are going to be there when they need them most for themselves, but, but also for, for their children. And so that remains a, a top priority for me and, and for our government. Uh, we've also talked a lot about uh, long-term care um, and the, the tragedy that's, that's unfolding across the province, um, not just in Durham, but everywhere in, in those facilities. Um, many calling for a review of the system that the Premier himself has admitted that it is, it's a broken system. Absolutely, it, it doesn't take uh, an expert to recognize that we've had uh, significant problems in the long-term care sector for the last number of decades. And I know um, I've been on your show previously, Deborah, talking about some of the work, I, the, the first work I did as a member of provincial parliament when elected in June, 2018, my first private members bill was around the issue of seniors and, and housing, making sure there are places where seniors can age in place. Um, and, and some of that's of course gonna be in just the, the housing that's available outside of long-term care homes, but we also need to make sure when they get to that point, when they have to move into a long-term care home, that we have the highest standards um, uh, for long-term care in this province. Um, we knew there were cracks in, this, in the system and certainly um, this crisis has shone a light on, on those cracks. And so there's no question there's going to need to be some sort of review 
um, after this. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, just today, our Minister of Long-Term Care came out committing to, to a review. Uh, well, there'll have to be, of course, discussions on what the scope of it is um, and, and who is doing this review um, when we get to that point. Um, but I think that we, we all know there are going to be important questions that need to be asked after this. Um, we've sort of seen a, a, a perfect storm in long-term care homes where we know many people that move in uh, to long-term care facilities have pre-existing uh, conditions. They're in a very vulnerable state. Um, and so as soon as um, a, a serious virus like COVID-19 gets in, um, it's very easy for it to spread. Um, so I think, you know, the two, two big issues we see in the sector are um, just capacity in the region. The number of beds we have in Durham region is very low. With, uh, when I was elected uh, within the Central East Lynn, uh, which is the area we fall fall under uh, the local health integration network, we had the longest wait times for long-term care beds in the whole province. Uh, so we, we need to make sure we're getting the beds not only announced, but built and, and at the highest quality. And there's also been a, a, an acknowledgement of uh, the challenges around staffing in the sector um, for a long time. And actually before COVID, the Minister of Long-Term Care had started uh, a study in February um, to come up with a long-term plan uh, for sustainable uh, staffing in the sector. So, so both of those issues we know need to be addressed and we've known, um, so that doesn't change, but uh, I think for sure there's going to have to be some sort of review at the end of this. Uh, we've only got about a couple of minutes left, so I, I do want to ask you just about the uh, tremendous community support that, that you've seen um, in, in your area and everybody basically pulling together, rolling up their sleeves and doing what they can to help other people. Absolutely, and I go back to um, just one example that, that stands out. Uh, Ontario Power Generation and Ontario Tech University have been working together to use the 3D printers that they have to produce face shields. And so just as they were starting to be produced, you know, they were, uh, Ontario Tech had let me know they, ha they had boxes ready and wondered if there were any needs in our, our community. And, and uh, you know, just like people are contacting me with supply, there are also people uh, contacting me with various needs. And so um, it was really special to be able to connect um, Ontario Tech with some of our local um, uh, homes for, uh, adults with severe mental uh, health issues um, who, who were really in need of PPE. And, and so Ontario Tech was able to drop off a box for, for a home. There's a home in Bowmanville and two homes in Oshawa that were able to benefit from these uh, face shields, their staff and their residents. Um, but that's just one example. The, these kinds of connections are being made every day. Um, people are coming to me with donations of PPE. And um, when you're one of these smaller facilities, um, it, it can be hard to navigate where, where you should go. Um, and so our office has been doing the best we can to connect, you know, people that, that come to us with those needs. I'm going to have to stop you there because we're almost out of time. Our thanks to MPP Lindsay Park and to MPP Pravmeet Sarkaria. Until next time, I'm Deborah Hutchison. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. kilometers away. They forced them to go to the Indian Rest Central School. More than 150,000 of us children had to go. They wanted to change us. Our Father in heaven, Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Kill the Indian and the child. It's been called cultural genocide. I survived residential school. My brother Johnny did not. 
Chani Wenjack was one of thousands of children who died due to Canada's residential school system. More than 80,000 survivors and their families still live with its legacy today. My husband is a wonderful man and a great father when he's not drinking. I'm so angry he chooses alcohol over us. If he really loved us,